One of my earliest memories of snow was captured by my parents here in Wisconsin. And this is my fraternal twin sister and I. And I'd like you to guess, who, who do you think is who? Raise your hand if you think I'm in the pink. If you think I'm in the blue. Yeah, all right, my dimples give me away. <laughs> It's not hard to tell, and, and I still make this same face on a snowy winter morning when I pull back the curtains. And my son also has a similar reaction to snow, dimples included. And it wasn't long after this photo was taken that my dad's job moved us east to New Hampshire. And I remember discussing on the 20-plus hour ride in this car with my sisters just how much more snow New Hampshire had than Wisconsin. This was a rumor that was substantiated by my cousins who already lived here. And little did I know that this trip, this journey, would set me on a course to become a climate scientist still fascinated by snow. When we got here, one of the first things my parents did was go to a local ski swap and pick us up each a pair of beat-up atomic skis. Uh, their friends had been living in Vermont for a number of years, and so they took us to their local ski hill, Suicide Six. And Suicide Six has its place in U.S. ski history. This is the longest-running lift-serve mountain in the United States. In the 1930s, they installed a hodgepodge Ford engine rope tow that was designed on a prototype that had been built in Quebec. And I remember riding up the rope tow here. It's right that little J bar in the corner and lookers left with my sisters. And by the end of the day, we had mastered the pizza. I also remember my parents standing at the bottom of the hill, arms outstretched like goalies, ready to intercept us should we not be able to stop or turn. And you can imagine how this would have gone. Three of us, two of them. <laughs> right? Arms stretched out. My dad saying, you get Jesse, I got Lizzie, Katie, turn right, turn right. <laughs> it was the best. And by the end of that season, we had mastered the face. That's that gigantic open uh, trail that's right in the center. It was the steepest, mogliest trail that we had ever seen. Now, Suicide Six remains open to this day, but many resorts have not been so lucky. In fact, some 600 plus ski resorts have closed since the 1950s. Some of this is due to the boom bust and the popularity of skiing. Some of this is due to the fact that a lot of the smaller resorts were the ones that closed. These were small mom and pop operations with no more than a single rope tow. And they, they simply couldn't compete with the bigger operations that had invested in snowmaking and had more terrain offerings. But dismal winters also play a strong role. It plays a role through what's known as backyard syndrome. This was actually a phenomenon studied at the University of New Hampshire by Dr. Larry Hamilton who noticed that skiers respond not just to how much snow is at the mountain, but also how much is in their backyard. And this makes sense. If it's a really big snowstorm, you're like, yeah, grab those skis out of the garage, head up to the mountains. If it's a rainy, warm February day, you're probably more likely to stay home. And when we think about this, it's not surprising that we see these types of impacts. We also need to consider the fact that in New Hampshire, things have been changing quite a bit. It was my love of skiing that drew me to snow science. I had actually been working at the Seacoast Science Center as a seasonal naturalist. I called myself a tide pool tour guide. And when I saw this seminar flyer come through, and it was, it was for a speaker coming to talk about climate change in the Northeast. I didn't make it to the seminar, but I tracked down the speaker's information. Dr. Cameron Wake, also at the University of New Hampshire. I'm sure all of you know him. Yep. And so he sent me his group's 2004 report, Climate Indicators in the Northeast, Past, Present, and Future. And one sentence really stuck out at me. Specifically, it said that winter was the fastest warming season in the U.S., or in the Northeast U.S. And this struck me. I mean, I was a skier and rider. I'd been skiing and riding for about 15 years at that point. I recognized it. I remembered recent years when my older sister and I would put on shorts and a t-shirt and go running at the high school track instead of putting on our snow pants and parkas and going skiing. So I very quickly applied to and was accepted to graduate studies at the University of New Hampshire. And at my master's thesis, I decided to collect the highest quality temperature, snowfall, and snow depth records that I could find for the northeastern US. And the results were alarming. Our winter temperatures had warmed over three degrees Fahrenheit since the 1960s. 
we had also seen that some of the snowfall trends were a little mixed, and this made sense. A warmer atmosphere can actually hold more moisture. As long as the temperatures remain below freezing, you will still get snow. Keeping the snow on the ground, however, is challenging. And those warming trends had reduced the length of our snow season by one to two weeks. And this is one of those things that's, that can be hard to accept. When we surveyed people in the Northeastern United States, we surveyed 1,000 people by telephone, and we asked them, are winters warmer today than they were 30 to 40 years ago? Less than half of the respondents responded correctly, yes, they are warmer. Climate change can be hard to accept. It can be hard to recognize. And this, this reminds me of the, my son. He's four years old. And he had asked me what, I, what my job is. I said, well, I'm a climate scientist. He said, looked at me quizzingly. Like, so you're going all the way to the top, mama? <laughs> Thought I was climbing. Try <laughs> it. You're so cute. <laughs> And it makes sense. I mean, like, a four-year-old doesn't know what climate is. I don't expect him to. But he does understand weather. And he also under, has, has expectations of what weather should be like in the Northeast at winter. I remember on December 22nd of this year, or last year, sorry, on December 22nd of last year, we had no snow in the seacoast. And he noticed this. He said, but Mama, it's Christmas. There's supposed to be snow. When... Maybe it'll snow tomorrow, and it didn't. It didn't snow tomorrow. It didn't snow the next day. It didn't snow on Christmas. And in fact, the next snow we got was after the entire holiday week. It was January 3rd. And the two inches that we got all melted within a day. Our next storm didn't come until the end of January. And the little snow cover we got then also disappeared in four days. That was after a big rainstorm. And it's, it's one of those things where, where the trends have just continued. We have seen winter warming show up as a hot spot for the Northeast US. Compared to the rest of the US, our winters are one of the fastest warming in the whole region. And this can be troublesome. I mean, it can be one of those things where you have to wonder, what are we doing about this? I find myself thinking about other impacts that are happening in our ecosystems. It's not just a shorter snow season. We're also seeing earlier melt in our rivers and streams. We're also seeing more of our winter precipitation fall into rain instead of snow. Another major winter indicator is when our lakes are icing out. We also see sites like this. This is my field site, one of them in Durham, New Hampshire. And it looks like the end of the melt season, right? And what you can't tell by looking at this photo is that I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. This was one of the hottest days ever recorded in Boston history. It was 72 degrees. The low that night was 66 degrees. That's like sleep with your windows open type of weather. I had to wonder, at the end of this day, is this the end of my snow season? Are we going to get more snow in March? It wasn't clear. This was also a year when ice out was occurring earlier. There we go. This is my mom. <laughs> it's 1967. She's holding her very, uh, a rather large pickerel. And my dad had taken her on her first ice fishing trip probably her last as well, <laughs> judging by her face. <laughs> but this isn't Winnipesaukee. This isn't New Hampshire. This is New Jersey. This is Lake Hopatcong, right outside of Hackensack. And Lake Hopatcong was originally two ponds when the Lene Nenape first uh, settled the region 12,000 years ago. And when colonizers came in, about 1750, they put in a dam, it became a single pond. It has since become a very popular ice fishing location, especially in the 1960s. And when my mom was growing up, the average winter temperature there was below freezing. Today, just one generation later, it's now above freezing. It's 34 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Ice fishing is still very popular on this pond, but lake ice is less reliable. We're also seeing fishing derbies canceled. And this concerns me on multiple levels. Are we losing a way of life in the Northeast? My life as a, a snow researcher can be rather invigorating. You probably recognize the smile. It's the same smile my parents captured on film when I was four years old. And I just love nothing more than spending my day outside measuring snow. But it can also take a psychological toll. This was a snowy day, but we also have our not so snowy days. We have our bare ground days, the brown days. And those days we still go out and we still record the zero. And the zeros have started to pile up. But what really keeps me up at night are the climate model projections I work on. These sophisticated supercomputers can tell us something about our future. And what I see is not encouraging. If we don't act, if we continue on this path of emitting greenhouse gases, of letting them accumulate in the atmosphere, the seacoast of New Hampshire will have a winter season more like Virginia. A few weeks of snow at most. If we do act, there's the, the hope, is that we could preserve up to two months of winter into the future. This is by the end of the century. This is my son's lifetime. When I think about how else we can act, it's, it becomes hard. I start worrying about not just the future and what it's going to look like, but how the future generations that follow us are going to react. I'm training students to measure snow at these sites. Are they still going to be able to do that when they're professors? I worry also about winter sports in the state. And there's some sports that I, I grew up enjoying skiing. My mom grew up enjoying ice fishing. <laughs> and when I think about my son, he, he got to go skiing for the very first time this year. He had a blast. This was two days before this mountain closed for the, for the year. It was in the springtime. And as soon as we got down from the mountain, he was like, when can we do that again? That was so much fun. And regrettably, I'm like, okay, next season, we'll get there, definitely. And it, it just had to make me wonder, I mean, that previous winter, we had tried to go locally. There's a little hill right here in the seacoast, Powderhouse Hill. Yeah. $5 for a ticket, one rope tow. It's 20 minutes from my house. And we had really hoped to spend some time there with him this winter, but the snow was so hard to come by that getting the days to line up and get out there were next to impossible. I also worry about New Hampshire. We attract 2.1 million skier visits every season. National Ski Areas Association defines one skier visit as one person visiting one ski resort for all or part of a day. So that's a lot for a small state. During our warmest, least snowy years, our skier visitation declines by 25%. That means that we're losing out on $40 million in economic activity. And if you live in the North Country, half of the economic spending is coming from the ski industry during that season. You feel the economic pinch of climate change. I worry also about what this means not just for New Hampshire and our economy and our local communities, but for the communities that rely on snow, not just for currency, but for drinking water. The ones that rely on it for irrigation for their crops, the food they eat. The ones that rely on it to maintain their ecosystems and prevent devastating forest fires. When I think about our future, I wonder how people are going to act. And I wonder how other people react when they see a winter like 2018-19 in the seacoast, when they see a midwinter heat wave like we saw in 2017. Some people feel rejoice, right? break from regularly scheduled winter conditions when it gets that hot. Other people feel disturbed, uncomfortable like they don't even recognize their own home, 
That's how I felt. And it turns out there's actually a name for this. Oops, I oh, missed that one. It turns out that there's a name for this, solastalgia. It combines the word solace, that comfort of home that you get, and nostalgia, that melancholy of homesickness. So it's a term coined by a philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, and he was doing this more in the context of people who are experiencing devastating forest fires when they lose their home and their community, or people who have experienced mountaintop remo removal mining. The mountain they grew up with is no longer there. It can take a psychological toll on us to experience these changes in our home, in our own environment. Climate change can, it can be abstract. It can be one of those things that it's full of statistics or it's devastating events that you might not even see happening before your eyes, like melting ice sheets. We certainly experience those effects more locally. But when we see these changes in our own backyard, skiing in New Hampshire, loss of ice fishing in New Jersey, we can grasp it. It's right there in front of us. So I stand here not necessarily just as a concerned climate scientist, but as someone who loves snow, as someone who lives here in New Hampshire and loves New Hampshire, and someone who loves our planet and wants to see it preserved for our future generations and our current generation. So I ask you to please join me in this effort to preserve this vital part of our home. Thank you. Take my hand and come with me into this crystal scenery and wait.